I'm going to talk about loss, coping, and moving forward. I teach for a living. So that's hence the PowerPoint and the academic bent. But I sometimes think that, you know, we're all pretty clear about our emotions and our life experience. And it's sometimes helpful to hear what the so-called experts have to say and how that can either back up what we're feeling or give us a new way of thinking. You are all pretty darn resilient or you wouldn't still be here. You may not feel particularly resilient today, but um, you've all had losses and you are still standing, which is to your credit. And loss and grief are not as well understood as we would like to believe. You know, as well as I do, and probably better, that in fact, in our world, we don't talk about death people become really, really uncomfortable. They become uncomfortable with disability. They become uncomfortable with job loss. We don't use words like dead and died and death very often. We use passed away or, you know, has thrown off this mortal coil or we have every kind of euphemism known to mankind. And we know that people are really, really hurried through um, a disability, or a death in their family. We pretty much, the experts say at about three weeks, the meals will stop, the phone calls will stop. And I would argue that it may be even quicker than that because we live in such a fast paced society where people don't really have the time. They kind of keep moving. And we, as people who are grieving, sit back and think, wait a minute, what just happened here? Why is no one else feeling what I'm feeling? So, um, but despite the fact that no one talks about death and dying with a great deal of comfort, loss and grief and loss, not just related to death, but related to injury or job loss or financial issues or marital breakdown or relationship breakdown, any kind of loss experience has grief. And we know that loss can be physical. It can be the loss of a relationship. We know it can be political. We know that it can feel like a loss of power, certainly a loss of freedom, maybe a loss of authority or a sense of self associated with a job or a role that's super important to us. Loss is psychological. It's functional. You lose function in our body. Um, There's a cognitive change, our thoughts, our our minds are shifted by loss. And of course, loss can be very personal. And along with losses, there's often a shift in finances or or, uh, economical um, ability to uh, take part in the world around us. You mentioned homelessness and you mentioned the issue around affordable housing, those are huge. And if you have a disability on top of, of trying to afford the world we live in, it can be a monumental struggle. It can feel like there's a loss of safety. There may be a loss of, of sexual function or sexual desire. There can be kind of an existential crisis. If I'm not my job, who am I? If I'm no longer... Um, Bob, for lack of a better name, I'm pulling that out of the air, his wife, because he's no longer here. Who am I? How do I define myself? Can be a spiritual loss. Some people, when they've had a a big loss in their life or a big change in their life, as you well know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys are the experts, um, can really feel like they've lost their spirituality or their religion. There can be cultural losses. You can lose your community. Um, the cultural losses I mentioned, financial, social losses, you know, people that don't know how to deal with this. Sometimes um, your best friend disappears because they don't like to see you in pain when you need them the most or, you know, attachments associated with those relationships. And, you know, we talk about loss as primary or secondary. In in the courses that I teach, a primary loss is the big loss. 
It's the the death or the disability or the divorce or the job loss. Um, the secondary loss is everything that falls out because of that. So if you become disabled, maybe you can no longer afford your rent. So you have to move. And maybe that means because you have to move, your children have to change schools. So it's all the grief that unfolds as a result of the big loss. Um, some of this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to you or I, because a major or minor loss is, of course, in the eye of the beholder. What I think of as major, you might think as, oh, come on, Eunice, pull yourself together. You should see what I've been through. So major and minor tend to be um, in the eye of the beholder. There are some things that we can absolutely agree are major, like a death or uh, a disability or someone dying at their own hand um, or a fire. We can understand those as major. But, you know, some of the other ones they might be up for a little bit of discussion. Actual loss and threatened loss. It's really interesting that when researchers do studies of loss, that sometimes the actual loss, for instance, if you think of someone who's about to be, who knows that there are lay, layoffs at work, they're threatened. The uncertainty is often much worse than when it actually happens, when the loss actually happens. Even if we have chosen uh, a certain path, um, or if the path has been imposed on us, either way, there can be losses and there can be lo there can be grief or loss, even with very happy events. Many of the people on the call were talking about moving their um, young children, young young adult children into residence for university this weekend and next. And that's a chosen happy, happy event, but there can be loss. There can be a little bit of grief. There can be a little bit of worry associated with that. And then of course there can be sudden in, in the case of threads of life, many of the people who um, participate in threads of life have had a sudden loss and that really kicks the skids out from underneath us. We're not prepared. We don't have time to kind of, you know, get our sea legs underneath us. And of course, those secondary losses are like dominoes. So as I said before, you have the big loss and then all the things that fall out from that. Roles, finances, loss of dreams or hopes or plans for the future or understanding you know, what's next. So grief, again, not as well understood as we would hope that it is, but we teach a lot of different courses on grief in our program. And grief is physical. Those of you um, who are grieving or have grieved in the past will know, uh, sadly, through personal experience, that you feel loss and grief in your body. Heartache didn't get its name for no reason. You have an ache in your chest, your joints hurt, you don't sleep, um, your head aches, you have no energy. It's a very, very physical response and people don't understand that particularly. Of course, there's the emotional response, the crying, the um, not knowing what to do with yourself, but we're learning more and more and more about the brain changes, the neurological changes that happen because of grief. And we can talk about that a little bit more later if you're interested. There are physiological changes. You are changed at a cellular level by grief. So for instance, if any of you have an autoimmune disorder or you are diabetic or you have a health concern, and you are grieving, do not be surprised if you need more medication, you need more insulin, or you have a flare up of your autoimmune disorder because your body is reacting, mind, heart, and soul, and body. Um, of course, psychosocial changes. We talked a little bit just briefly about how the support 
can dwindle away really, really quickly. We don't live in in the world that we lived in 150 years ago, where people would rally and they you would live in mul- in um, multi generational houses and there would be lots of people around. It's very likely that we are far flung from our family. We may not know our neighbors that well, or we may not have people that we can lean on in the way that we could have maybe 100 years ago. There are economic changes. Um, Things change when someone dies or someone becomes disabled. Your immune system will react. Cardiovascular, broken, dying of a broken heart is not a myth. It does happen. It has a technical name, but it comes from the shock of losing someone. And if you already are prone to cardiac disease, it is not unlikely. Um, or unheard of, and I have personally known working in palliative care and oncology for as many years as I have of many people who have lost both parents in the space of three days, one to cancer or to their terminal illness, and the other to a heart problem. Your neurotransmitters, those little brain waves sending messages, and your neurochemistry changes. So again, we are learning more and more and more about how grief impacts us right across the board. And some of us are more at risk than others for struggling with grief, struggling with getting our bearings again, struggling with being resilient, struggling with um, coping long-term. And of course, we're partly hindered by the fact that um, We still live in a world that talks about closure. Um, The students know that I have several rants, and one of my rants is about closure. There's no such thing. That's a load of um, goods that we've been sold. Um, And you know as well as I do that if you lose someone important to you, you may not be actively, actively grieving and incapable of getting on with your day-to-day life forever, but you will certainly be eight years, 10 years, 15, 20, 30, 40 years out hearing a song on the radio or watching a movie that they really loved or thinking about them at a birthday celebration. We grieve forever. And of course, the people who are at risk are really people who have sudden, unexpected losses or untimely losses. So untimely losses, and this is no surprise to any of you, is if a child dies, or if a young person dies, or, you know, young is a relative term. I think when I was 25, young was, you know, a six-year-old. Now that I'm much older, anybody around my age or younger is, it's an untimely loss. Um, Off-time losses, you know, you don't expect um, your 35-year-old partner to become disabled, or to become sick, or to become chronically ill, or to die, or losses that make no sense. Accidents, horrible accidents, bereavement because of murder or because of suicide, having multiple losses. So one thing after another, after another, after another, so you can never get your equilibrium back. Um, If you took care of the dying person for a very long time, that can lead to more risk for struggling. And you might wonder why, because you knew the person was dying. It's not a sudden shock. It is, however, a huge loss of roles and of community associated with taking care of that person or going to visit them every day in a rehab or a nursing home or a long-term care place. Um, Poor health, if you've already started with poor health, especially heart disease. If you live in um, unsafe conditions, you're underhoused or you um, are threatened by the people you live with or your neighborhood, those can be all things that make it harder. And of course, being isolated or lonely. And this is a huge problem. It is such a huge problem, loneliness and isolation, that in fact, in Britain, they have started a ministry of health branch 
looking at isolation and loneliness because they have recognized that it has a huge impact on people's health and ability to cope. So, and it's easy to be sad and lost, um, you know, not just about death, but about, and not just about our own losses. Let's face it, we're all dealing with our own grief, but there's a war going on and there's an opioid crisis and climate change is happening. The students that I teach have been um, beside themselves after the, uh, the pandemic and because of climate change and high temperatures and wildfires and fires and flooding and storms. And, you know, the nightly news is really disheartening and crime and the high rate of family breakdown and the brokenness of the world. We add that to what we're already feeling and it can make us feel really overwhelmed. But that's about as sad as I'm going to make you, I hope, because I'm going to say right now um, that you shouldn't believe all you read. And then we're going to start talking about how we can be more resilient. Um, first of all, there are no stages, those good old five stages. They're not real. Uh, yes, they were written about and yes, they are things that occur, but even, even Dr. Kubler-Ross didn't think they were stages. She was trying to describe the dying process. And so there are no stages. There is no closure. There is no time frame. Good old Freud said, oh, you know, it probably takes about a year to get over your grief. But, you know, he was Jewish and Jewish people have very clear rituals for the first year after someone dies. So it was really helpful for him to hang his theories about mourning and melancholia on rituals and belief systems that he already had. Yes, a year is a good time limit, but we're learning more and more and more that the second year is often harder because there are no anniversary dates. There are no little points along the road where you can say, okay, well, this is the first birthday. This is the first Thanksgiving. This is the first Hanukkah. This is the first uh, anniversary. Um, there is no time limit and there is absolutely no right way to grieve. It is as individual as, um, as we are. And there are many ways, there are as many ways to cope and to manage as there are people. Many of you have gotten support from Threads of Life. You've joined groups or you run groups or you connect people with referral sources. And so some of the ways that we are resilient, and we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about resilient in a minute, are things like writing, journaling, art, groups, sports. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go and speak to someone about how you're grieving. You might do 59 links of the pool. Oh my goodness. But those things all help. Or working. Some people bury themselves and work a little bit. Talking, reading, um, reading books about loss, watching movies about loss, friends, support, or doing things completely unrelated to grief to get a bit of a break from it. Um, one of the ladies, I can't remember her name, was doing a great deal of self-care and uh, had a manicure and, and a massage and those kinds of things. Those can be incredibly helpful. So we're talking about coping and we're talking about resilience and moving forward. And part of how you look at coping um, is often what worked in the past, you know, and why would I do something that someone has told me, some so-called expert has told me to do if I tried that before and it didn't work? You know, if someone says to me, Eunice, you've got a journal, that's what's going to help. And I really don't like it or I don't get anything out of it, but I do get a lot out of walking with my neighbor for half an hour every night. So if it worked in the past, maybe pull it out of your back pocket and try it again. What no longer works? You know, the thing that was really carrying you for a month or two months might not carry you at the six month point or the two year point or the six month or the six year point. 
Um, who helped in the past? And again, we can't always count on the people we think we can count on. Um, it's often, you know, our ditzy Aunt Mabel who rushes in with casteroles and a shoulder to cry on. And, you know, most of the time she can't get from point A to point B without losing her keys. But in a crisis, she's your woman. So maybe she didn't help in the past, but maybe she's up to the task now. And maybe the people who were able to help in the past um, can still help. One of the saddest things I think about grief, and certainly when I've experienced deep grief, is that the person who helped in the past is no longer with us. And so now we have to find new people or different people or the people that we have in our lives to help us in a slightly different way. Do those people help now? Do those things help now? And are there new ways of coping or getting support? You know, many people would no more go to a group and talk in front of strangers than they would go to the moon if they were offered the opportunity. But in truth, um, many people will come to something like this or they will download a video and sometimes that leads to actually going to a group and getting support that way. Because who better than someone who's been through what we've been through? But it's a hard, it's hard, and it's a process. Grieving is a process. It is not something that's done and over with. And, you know, we often, I used to run bereavement groups at the local hospice as a volunteer for about seven and a half years. And people would say, well, I should be over it now. Like it's like it's been so long or I was doing great for the first two years. And now here I'm coming to a group in my third year. How does that even work? Because it is hard and because it is a process. And as I said in one of our first slides tonight, we don't live in a society that has a whole lot of patience for sadness and tears and um, overwhelm. Um, and it's not an end state. There's no, there's no line in the sand that says, okay, I'm done now. I'm good. I'm finished because there's no such thing as closure. There's feeling better. There is time helping, but I think we, um, sell ourselves short if we put a time limit on what we're feeling. So one of the things that we used to do, um, at school is a loss history. Now, this is something you might want to pull out your pen and paper for, or maybe not. Let me just tell you what it is, first of all. So what we used to ask the students to do, because the whole program is about death and dying and palliative care and death doula work and grief, was to track their loss history at different stages and ages. So as a child, as an adolescent, as a young adult, as an adult, we have many adult learners. We have lots of students in their 60s and 70s and 80s. So we would ask them to look at their losses. I never felt comfortable with that assignment because these are young people. They're away from home, many of them for the very first time. And I just felt it was a little bit dangerous to have people who are maybe overwhelmed with school, maybe have just had a relationship breakup or they're away from home and feeling unsure, maybe struggling to make friends, et cetera, struggling with schoolwork, feeling their confidence is in their boots. And we asked them to look at their losses. Oh my gosh, well, this did not feel good to me. So we changed it. We changed it because I went to a number of courses on trauma and grief. And what we asked people to do instead was a timeline, still the timeline, still the history piece, but we shifted it. And we asked people to look at, yes, their losses, but also their victories, their high points. We actually called it stones and petals. Uh, the assignment is called stones and petals. And it, the reason it's called that is because um, that's what I was taught. Um, and what we asked them to do then was to, yes, look at their losses because we carry them with us, but also to look at the really great things that had happened. And then at the end to say 
how have these great things and these not so great things made me who I am today? And I can tell you that it was a thousand percent better and different and the students absolutely loved the assignment. So if it's something that you think might be helpful to you, um, maybe think about adding, you know, kind of doing a tracking if you like to journal or if you like art, some of the students do it in, in big pictures and stuff, or they do a PowerPoint or they do other creative things, a little podcast. And they talk about their stones, the bad things, the not so great things, the loss of their dog, their grandmother uh, becoming ill, um, not getting into the program they wanted. Um, a couple of people talked about having an injury and not being able to play hockey. And, you know, they were almost drafted or not being able to getting too tall and not being able to be a ballet dancer like they'd always dreamed. So, and then they talked about great things like, you know, I don't know, their um, things in their family, all kinds of things. So it was a way that was much more trauma informed that was a much kinder, gentler way of talking about um, their grief. So that's one thing that you can do. And then another thing is, and many of you maybe have already done this, but is to talk about your joy list. Now, I will first tell you when I first heard about this assignment, because I was at a conference, and um, it was many, many years ago. It's probably 30 plus years ago, but it stuck with me. And the woman was a stress management. Um, she wasn't a grief uh, expert, but she was a stress management um, consultant. She had 300 of us uh, oncology nurses, uh, so cancer nurses, palliative care nurses in the room in Saskatchewan. Where were we? We were in Saskatoon. Um and she said she was doing this whole thing three hours long. She did a number of exercises, but this is the one that stuck with me. She said, okay, I want you to pull out a pen and paper. And of course, all being nurses, we're very compliant. Most of us are women, even more compliant um, and nice. We want to do nice. We want to be supportive of her and make sure her <laughs> session goes well. She said, I want you to write down the numbers one to 10 in a column. And I want you to write down 10 things that give you joy. And she stopped talking. And she said, oh, wait a minute, before I go any further, I'm not talking about going to Paris for the weekend or uh, winning a million dollars. I'm talking about spending time with grandkids, playing with my puppy, um, having a nap on a rainy afternoon. I'm talking about little bite-sized things that give you joy. So we started writing. You could hear a pin drop in that auditorium. And again, 300 plus of us. And then you started hearing shuffling. And then you started hearing giggling. And then you started hearing people feeling really uncomfortable. She gave us about 10 minutes and she said, okay, who's at 10? Well, there's always one, right? Somebody in the back waves their hand and says, I have 10. And, you know, 299 sets of eyes turn on her and, you know, she would have been incinerated if we had death rays because most of us struggled. And she said, okay, how many have nine? And she counted down. Many people in the room had forgotten what brought them joy. So they had very short lists. Then she made it even worse, if you can imagine. She said, okay, take a look at your list. I think I had four, maybe four on my list. And she said, okay, take a look at your list. And when was the last time you did anything from that list? And I could not believe that the number one thing on my list was something that I had not done for six years. So one of the things you might take away with you as a way to build resilience and to go forward, and I'm not say stop grieving because I don't believe we do, is to do a joy list. Then she got, uh, as she was leaving, she said, okay, what I want you to do now is to get that list to 20. 
or 30 or 50 or 100. Put it in your phone. Put it not in our phones in those days because we didn't have phones that walked around with us, but um, put it in your day book, put it on your calendar and do one thing from that list every day. Might be fun to try. Um, We also know that from the research and resilience that having gratitude for things that are still good, joyful in your life, helps with resilience. And again, not making that up, that is from the literature. Uh, I'm going to specifically talk about a neurophysiologist who, a psychologist actually, who um, works with people who've had a brain injury, a traumatic brain injury in a few minutes. And gratitude is one of the things she talks about as well. Having your own personal toolbox, things that you pull out of your back pocket, either your joy list or your self-care list, or some of the things we talked about a minute ago, art, journaling, going for a walk. One of the biggest indicators of being able to be resilient, and this um, neuropsychologist doesn't refer to it as bouncing back. She refers to it as bouncing forward, um, is flexibility. The flexibility mindset that we can and will do whatever is needed to go forward. Sure, there are days when your resilience is at four or two or one when you think, I don't have the energy. Uh, I don't want to, or I don't believe it's ever going to get better. But in fact, the on the days when we're a little bit more energetic or we're feeling a little bit stronger, believing that we are going to get through this by hook or by crook is very, very important to actually getting through it. Um, And grief is definitely part of the journey. Anne Lamott is a a writer that I like very much. She talks a lot about um, spirituality. Um, And I cannot read this because I have to move my banner. So I will move my banner and then I will read it to you. You will lose someone you can't live without. Your heart will be badly broken. And the bad news is that you will never completely get over the loss of your beloved. But this is also the good news. They live forever in your broken heart that doesn't seal back up. And you come through. It's like having a broken leg that never heals perfectly, that still hurts when the weather gets cold, but you learn to dance with a limp. So grief is part of our journey as people on this planet. We cannot escape it. Um, We cannot escape sadness. We cannot escape disappointment. We cannot escape bad things happening to us. So dying, someone we love dying, death, And in fact, even aging and the different things that we lose as we age, there are many things we gain, but there are things that we lose. There are disappointments in our life. There are unanswered prayers or prayers that are answered in ways that eh, not, excuse me, necessarily the way I wanted them to be answered. Or your dreams are never realized. You know, you never win the lottery and go on a world round the world cruise or whatever those big dreams that we all have are. Maybe there's a disability that shifts and changes the way we are in the world or the way our loved ones are in the world. Ill health. Um, Most of us do not escape unscathed. You know, we have health concerns. We have things we have to manage. Maybe we've lost our faith or we've lost our community or we've had to rebuild community or we don't have faith in our province, (laughs) province's health care or support for homeless people or our country, or we've lost connection. Again, getting back to the notion that isolation and loneliness are incredibly harmful to our health. Bereavement researchers, people who look at grief for a living, We'll tell you that the number one indicator of how someone is going to do when they are grieving, and this will be a surprise probably to none of you, 
is social support. It is the number one. Does that mean 6,000 friends on Facebook? No, it does not. It means one, two people, maybe even only one, three people, maybe a couple of family members that are there for you, that you can talk with, that you can be your real self with, that you can say what's really, really, really in your heart. Even if you feel like, oh my gosh, people will think I'm horrible uh, for thinking that or feeling that or saying that. Even one person. That's why if someone is incredibly isolated, a group or a friendly visitor or someone to talk to is so incredibly important. I'm not kidding. That is the number one indicator of how people will do social support, a buddy to go to tea with. Oh, and dying death and, gr and grief. Um, you don't have all the time in the world, you know, and we, we kind of forget um, that, but we also have to remember that we do have time and we can take that time and we can run with it and we can feel better about what's happening in the time we have. Many people, when they're grieving, feel like they need to get moving, you know, rush through it, get on top of it, manage it. Because we don't have all the time in the world. And I, you know, I'm, I want to get my life back. And I want to keep doing the things that are important to me, but I just don't have the energy now. So, you know, we can take that time to get our sea legs back underneath us and, and uh, to do things that help us. And at the risk of sounding like Pollyanna, and I am so far from Pollyanna, it's not even funny. There can be gifts in a loss, in a change, in something bad happening to us. And certainly I would never tell this to someone who was freshly grieving because they would have every right to punch me in the nose because no one wants to hear that, that somehow um, this will give me something else. Well, is my heart still going to be broken? Absolutely. But maybe I'm figuring out that I'm really pretty strong, or I find out who my friends are, or I find a community of people that I can talk to, or I have a really, really deep gratitude for the life I still have, um, or I have a sense of wonder or awe, or people have really stepped up and helped me, and I feel loved. And I'm maybe not as closed off as I used to be. Maybe I have new rituals. Maybe I have new connections or a new sense of grace or peace or maybe new priorities. Um, is that to say that losing someone close to us or having something really bad happen to someone close to us and to us is a good thing? No, it's not a good thing. We wouldn't sign up for that on our very worst days not for all the tea in China, but that's not to say that things can shift and change for us. It's a, it's a struggle, and we're going to be talking now about resilience, but it's a really challenging balancing act of holding space for loss and grief and sadness and feeling sorry for ourselves feeling it's unfair, questioning why this is happening, um, deep, deep sadness, and joy, and luminous moments. And I think that when people are grieving, one of the first times that they feel guilty is when they laugh for the first time. Um, at a grandchild's antics or something, uh, you know, on the news, uh, you know, some funny animal video or a cat video. Um, and they laugh and they stop themselves and they think, oh, my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm laughing. Um, but those luminous moments can be healing, too. So. What do we know about resilience? What do we know about people who can bounce forward, not bounce back? 
Well, we know a lot from the literature. And one of the things, and Flack has written a lot about thriving and resilient people. And if you don't do these things now, don't panic. Uh, these are the ways that we become more resilient. And you never, you cannot become resilient unless you've had a bad thing happen to you. One cannot happen without the other. You don't, you're not born resilient. Uh, you learn, you manage, you cope, you problem solve, you figure it out. Again, what works, what doesn't work, who's helpful, who's not helpful. Some of the stuff we very briefly talk, touched upon before. So Flack will tell you, and we're going to talk about a few different people and how they view resilience. People who set limits, people who can say, no, no, thank you. Not right now. No, I couldn't possibly. You don't need to be rude or abrupt or brusque, but you set limits. You think about what you need and you set limits. People who have a support system, there's that term again. Who copes? Support. People who have support. People who are able to take help, give help, so it's not just a matter of getting support from people, but giving support to other people also feels really good. And those of you who are a little bit further along the path, who've been able to reach back and help someone um, who's dealing with a much newer hurt, know that it can feel really good to be able to, to offer your expertise and your life experience and what you've learned works and doesn't work. Um, sadly, as women, we are often socialized to not ask for help. Or if we do ask, we don't really take it. We figure out a way that, oh, no, no, we're not, we're not going to actually take the help. Um, so we have to be careful about that because resilient people can take help. They can ask for it, actually take it when it's offered, say, yes, thank you. Um, and they can also give it. Resilient people are resourceful. They can problem solve. They figure out, okay, this is not working, or this person has let me down, or that group wasn't for me, and they figure it out. Maybe not right away. I think time slows down a little bit when we're grieving and we don't have a whole lot of energy. So maybe I'm not going to find a new group or a new contact next week, but I'm going to say, okay, that's my line in the sand. I'm setting a limit with that one, and I'm going to find something else. People who are resilient are patient, and not patient in the sitting, drumming your fingers and thinking, okay, when is this going to be over? They're patient in the sense that they know that these horrible feelings, this bad time will not last forever. You know, things like this too shall pass. Those things exist in our vernacular for a reason. Because people understand that the pain that they are feeling today is not going to be the same as the pain they feel two years from now. So they're patient. They can play the waiting game a little bit. They take responsibility. Um, and not for what has happened by any stretch of imagination, but for what they're going to do maybe set limits, maybe go and have a massage, maybe go to the swimming pool, maybe go for that run, maybe get out into nature. People who are resilient are open-minded as a general rule. Does that mean they're open to every new wave woo-woo thing that comes along? No, not at all. It just means, hey, someone said this might work. I might give it a try, or I might read that book, or I might go to that session where Eunice is talking about resilience. Um, they have a range of interests. Again, doesn't mean 52 things, but you know, is there something that really gives you joy? Maybe it's knitting, maybe it's reading, maybe it's going for that walk. Um, resilient people tend to be able to focus and commit to something. Now you're not focusing if you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. You are focusing if you're saying, Every Tuesday, I'm going to go for tea with my friend who's also been through something really tough. I'm committing to that. If I wake up that morning and I have a migraine headache, of course, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to make myself go. But I'm going to try. 
I'm going to try and do this. Um, the other thing that resilient people do is, um, and again, is this right away? Absolutely not. But they can tolerate a little bit of uncertainty. They can deal with, okay, I don't know how this is going to pan out. I don't know how this is going to play out, but I'm going to just keep going. And a little bit of autonomy. And I don't mean autonomy in the sense that I don't need anybody and I'm not going to ask for help from anybody. I mean that they try to be their own person. Um, the other things that Flack talks about are people who are creative. And creative doesn't mean that they're doing paintings in their basements. It just means that if one thing doesn't work, they try something else. It's problem solving. They have a little bit of insight at, or they're willing to look at what they're feeling, what they're thinking, how they're doing. They can tolerate pain, not forever and not deep, deep, deep heartache forever, but a little bit of pain, knowing that this is not going to last forever. Maybe a little bit of independence, certainly self-respect, so that you're not willing to be bullied or or um, manipulated by uh, other family members or friends who don't get it or don't get what you're going through. Um, people who are resilient are able to restore their self-esteem, um, to feel good about themselves again. They're willing to learn, go to a session like this, go to a Threads of Life meeting, go to the annual meeting. Um, they are able to make friends. Again, not 6,000. That's not a friend. That's an acquaintance. And we all know that acquaintances are not necessarily people we turn to in a crisis. That's not saying, though, that some of our acquaintances don't turn into friends um, when they're uh, tested by our losses. And they're able to depend maybe only on one person, but they're willing to do that. They're willing to be vulnerable. So how do we learn to become resilient? Well, part of it is, um, again, from the literature, Kornikova in 2016 talked about having a bit of a moral compass. That sounds highfalutin. It basically means what feels right, what feels wrong. I'm not crossing that boundary. I have this little moral code or I have my ethics or I have my standards. I'm not doing that. I don't care what people tell me to do. You know, so people who do things like, oh, you should date. You should do this. You should do that. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Nope. Doesn't feel right for me. I'm not doing it. You can just stop offering that to me. Thank you. Um, they use their mental energy wisely. Um so on the days where you cannot get out of your head or out of your heart, maybe that's a low energy day and you, you know, you do what you can at work or at home, um, but you don't push yourself. Maybe you find a role model, someone else in your group or at Threads of Life or somewhere else who seems to be doing not too badly. And again, they're not doing not too badly every single day of the week. So that's also a role model to know that you it's a kind of, again, process, two steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, one step back. Um, learn how to handle strong feelings. Sometimes there's no handling them. We just kind of let them sweep over us, knowing, again, that they're not going to last forever. Um, they can change the story. So again, getting back to that loss history, changing the story where it's not just focusing on all the losses, but also looking at the victories. So for instance, if you're grieving and you feel like you haven't been able to put 100% in at work, um, yeah, but you're showing up and you're doing maybe 80%. And trust me, no one at any of the other desks or in the unit, or, uh, you know, in the garage, or wherever you work, is doing 100% every single day of the week. Being compassionate with yourself, talking to yourself, that self-talk, that voice that's in your head, that is kind and caring as if they were talking to, you were talking to a beloved friend. 
Sometimes we are so kind to other people and we are so mean to ourselves and so impatient with ourselves. Konnikova also talks about meditating, and I'm not suggesting that you all become uh, meditators, but maybe some quiet time with some soft music and some deep breathing, it can help you feel better. And in fact, um, the students who are anxious beyond belief, as you can imagine, we often do deep breathing um, or, or um, visualizations before class to kind of get them back into their bodies and, and uh, help them calm themselves a little bit. Um, not forgetting to savor the things that give us pleasure. Back to the joy list. Back to, you know, getting, I don't know, getting a treat for yourself. Um, and tolerating pain because you know it's not going to last forever at this level. You will grieve forever, but it will not be as painful as that forever. Here's the neuropsychologist um, Deskel, um, who wrote, uh, who writes on uh, resilience with people who've suffered a traumatic brain injury. And she says that what has helped them build resilience and their family members build resilience is vulnerability. Now, that doesn't necessarily make good sense at first glance, particularly, but in fact, being comfortable with being vulnerable, that's going back to asking for help, seeking out help, talking about what you're feeling instead of thinking, oh, men don't feel like that, or oh, I shouldn't cry, or I shouldn't do this, or I shouldn't say that I'm struggling. So she says that vulnerability helps with resilience. She talks about, and I love this phrasing, productive perseverance. So you don't just keep running at that wall full tilt and bang your head against it. You figure out what's worth going at, persevering with, keeping going at, keeping with, and what is not. And if it's not, then we switch. We try something else. So it's productive perseverance. It's not forever. Oh, I've got to keep going. I've got to keep going. No, 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 you do not. Uh, if it's not working, you may need to take a different tack. Connection. Here we are with social support again. People who have suffered a traumatic brain injury and their families are more resilient when they have a connection, when they have support, when they have people around them. She talks about something, she's coined a new word, gratiosity, and it's gratitude and generosity for what we still have, for what people with a traumatic brain injury still have, for what, um, what is happening around us that's good, that feeds us, that feeds our souls. And people who are resilient uh, after an acquired brain injury um, are open to possibilities. Maybe not what they had planned, maybe not what they had hoped for or dreamed for, a different path, but still, maybe there are some possibilities here. Maybe there are some shifts and changes. Um, I have worked with many, many people who are terminally ill and their families after they have died and their families before they've died. And um, it's really fascinating to me how even in the face of a terminal illness, even in the face of death, people can say, you know what, I'm going to shift something here. This is not working for me. I had um, a very good friend who um, was terminally ill and uh, was still doing reasonably well. And she decided she didn't want to do the work she was doing anymore. And she changed careers, if you can imagine it. And she was for the last three years of her life, deliriously happy in her job. So there are possibilities. Or if you don't have any resilience, you can borrow some. 
So in palliative care and in death doula work, we talk about something called vicarious resilience. You've probably all heard of vicarious trauma, Um, you know, the trauma that you get by witnessing trauma. Well, you can get resilience by seeing other people being resilient, by looking around your group and seeing someone who, um, you know, was really, really struggling for months and now has gone back to work or someone who is now able to laugh, or someone who is um, doing something for themselves when they never, ever uh, put themselves into the equation before. So vicarious resilience is resilience that we can get from other people. And it works, believe it or not. Um. This is from um, a fellow, uh, Dr. Ben Shahar, who talks, his book is called Happier No Matter What, um, Cultivating Hope and Resilience and Purpose in Hard Times. And he has this uh, mnemonic spire. So he says in order to build hope, build resilience, get back on track a little bit, we need to think of different areas of ourselves. This goes right back to loss and grief. It's across all aspects of the human person. So the S stands for spiritual well-being, meaning, purpose, mindfulness, presence. P is physical well-being, taking care of your body, getting rest, getting recovery, dealing with stress and strain. We know more than ever how important sleep is. And often with grief, sleep is troubled. And I'm not suggesting that people go on sleeping pills by any stretch of the imagination, but there's lots of good information out there about sleep hygiene and ways to improve your sleep. And then if you are still struggling, your family doctor can give you a prescription for two or three nights of sleep medication um, to kind of jolt your system back into uh, some semblance of uh, routine, and then you're off the medication. I is for intellectual well-being, so learning, asking questions, failing. Um, interesting, though, um, those of you who've been um, in deep grief will know that the first thing to go is your ability to read and concentrate and focus. So that learning may come a little bit later or that learning may be done in snippets, a half hour lecture, um, you know, seeing a brochure on something and thinking about something a little bit differently. R is for relational well-being, back to social support, friendship, family. Being careful of always, always giving and always, always caregiving and always taking care of and allowing yourself to be taken care of. And E is for emotional well-being and pleasure, emotions, gratitude, not taking things for granted. And I think one of the biggest lessons when you lose someone um, that you love um, is you don't take life for granted anymore because the rug has been pulled out from underneath you. Um, and many people will say that that is in bereavement groups will talk about how they have a much deeper uh, respect for life and for relationships and for the things that are important in their life. So, one of the things you can do for resilience is finding your lighthouse or your lighthouses. That thing that is going to get you through, that focus. Um, as um, Terry Gimet says, once the lighthouse is seen, the rest of the sea is ignored. So maybe it's the lighthouse is getting up in the morning, getting a shower, feeding myself, 
maybe those in the early days, maybe the lighthouse then becomes going to group or seeing my family or going to the annual meeting for Threads of Life or whatever. And some of us have several lighthouses that keep us kind of focused and kind of, okay, I'm going to keep going towards the light. I'm going to keep going towards what's helping. 